What happens when a culture steeped in guerrilla warfare, a society accustomed to lionizing its heroes who stood up and died in resistance of outside invaders, comes into contact not with a domineering neighbor, but instead with a completely new outside force? The colonization of Vietnam was not a class decided solely by technological might, as we are so accustomed to imagining imperialism playing out, the Zulus coming with waves against semi-modern firearms or Maxim guns being used to savage tribes. This was a struggle between a people still living in agricultural-based society on the fringes of China's sphere of influence and a modern economy, industrialized and capable of producing and consuming on a scale unimaginable to other societies. It is a clash between a society which has spent the better part of a thousand years waging war as a dominant power in Europe and one that spent that time resisting and adapting as the invaded country. Welcome back to the History Hour with Mr. Kent and Professor White. This is part two of episode seven, Prelude to Disaster. We are discussing the collision of the Vietnamese civilization with Western imperialism in the form of France. In part one, we discuss everything from early hominids to the era of an independent Vietnam just before France's arrival. If you haven't seen it yet, go check it out. The late Nguyen court of the Vietnamese kingdom was not fully in control of its own country. In addition to major peasant uprisings, as well as other revolts that had occurred, they had a rising middle class, the merchant class, that was in contact with these Western elements. And in order to consolidate control, the Nguyen sought to more or less monopolize trade in order to break the rise of that class and limit their power, as well as deal with the overpopulation north, which they hoped to solve via the annexation of the south and treating it as a sort of colonial frontier for themselves, as well as deal with and mitigate the effect of Western outsiders and missionaries on their societies. During this later period, the Nguyen saw a dramatic rise in tension and violence inside their society, both between regional groups, such as the Southerners who were having Northerners emigrate into the regions, as well as ethnic conflicts between groups such as the Thai, the Laotian, the Vietnamese, and the Hmong. In 1833, Southerners actually joined behind a Cham in a Po Rasa movement, or the Wrath of God movement, a homegrown Islamic Jihad led by an actual Haji from the Cham clans who fought against the Nguyen Authority, Simnius immigrants, and the attempted Vietnamization of their culture and homelands in the South. In between the dates of 1802 to 1883, the emperors of Vietnam had to put down 400 different revolts against their authority throughout the entirety of the region they controlled. If this should give us any indication, it's that France is not stepping into a settled, a desolate, a calm piece of territory. Even the native dynasties are having trouble maintaining control when there is this division between classes, between ethnic groups, between formerly Khmer, formerly Champa regions and areas they're trying to extend into. This is a turbulent and not especially politically stable region overall. During this later period, when French colonialism is starting to step up and the English have already established significant control over the coast of China, the Vietnamese Nguyen dynasty realized that reform might well be necessary and there were desires to actually westernize and modernize some elements of society, especially after the Opium Wars had shown that a great power like China itself was not capable of defeating these westerners. However, the destabilized economy as well as the, as we talked about, unrest inside the country countryside left the Vietnamese central government relatively weak and actually in a large amount of debt and in need of raising money and taxes. In order to actually fund these projects and accumulate the taxes, they essentially gave in to some of the conserved elements inside society, the Confucian Mandarin class. By giving in to those traditional elites and reinforcing their power, they were essentially giving away the ability to move towards some sort of reform system, but also using them to collect more taxes and consolidate their own hold on power. It might have stabilized their regime internally, but it would ultimately leave them vulnerable for external threats. Despite being a foreign element in Vietnam, having so long been inundated with Confucian and Buddhist ideology, the missionaries did gain some support as they did in the early Roman period, initially working among the poor, peasants, farmers, fishermen, vagabonds, that sort of thing. As well, they were the first source of some Western technology, namely semi-modern medicine, which did make them popular and give them a real reason why the locals did have some favorability toward them. 
The earliest contact between some of these Europeans and the Vietnamese and the foreign missionaries was relatively hospitable. They had pretty decent things to say about one another. In 1633, Christophery Bori, an Italian Jesuit missionary, wrote, The Cochin Chinese, Vietnamese, are more gentle and courteous in conversation than any other nation of Europe. They stand much upon their valor. They ask us many questions. They invite us to eat with them, usually all kinds of courtesy, civility, and familiarity. It seems to us as if we were among ancient acquaintances. There is a fair gate open for the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ among them. Christianity have brought its own set of ideals, the sort of loyalty toward deity and by extension the church. Authorities did eventually deem Christianity to be incompatible with Confucianism, a system which had dominated their society for centuries, and believed it to be a source of undermining of their traditional values and the monarch. As years went on, however, and religion, Christianity, and Catholicism in particular became more associated with Europeanness, foreignness, and opposition to traditional conservative and Mandarin elements inside Vietnam, more hostility began to take place. A quote from Phan Ba Dat, a Vietnamese Imperial Mandarin in 1835 reads, The Western heterodox religion intoxicates the hearts of men, making it truly the most dangerous of all superstitions. We have abolished their churches and forbidden them to assemble for worship. It has long been known that the followers of the Western heterodox religions steal people's eyes. Except for that last sentence, it almost sounds like a modern YouTube atheist talking. In time, some Catholics did participate in some revolts, hoping to install emperors favorable to their beliefs. Some early executions of dissident priests were followed in 1836 by an edict from the emperor to execute all European priests. Though this edict was not always carried out, it was a story carried back to Europe and was a major propaganda victory for France. They used the execution of Monsignor Diaz, Spanish Bishop of Tonkin, as a justification to launch the Cochin China Expedition, the initial invasion of Vietnam. In the lead up to this, the missionaries were also one of the main sources of information about Vietnam for the French. They had, after all, lived among them and seen their society firsthand in a way that almost no other European had. As well, they were responsible for a somewhat familiar tale, if you're familiar with our last series. They had, for whatever reason, I guess because of the frequency of revolts and the unhappiness of various groups in fighting, they had convinced the French that the peasant population was seething and ready to rebel at the drop of a hat, and that once they entered the country, they would essentially be greeted as liberators. I guess the second part wasn't true, but as the revolts carried out over the next few centuries show us, I guess they were partly right. The missionaries operating in Vietnam in the 17th century also are responsible for Quoc Nguyen, perhaps mispronounced, but that is the Romanized uh, Vietnamese language that we talked about, the way they adapt their language to use uh, Western spellings. Also, the missionaries, while connected to France, while the first step on this process, were somewhat disconnected from the government's motives. Missionaries actually did see a way to expand their own influence. Increasingly, Europe was undergoing a period of secularization. As the Industrial Revolution changed society in so many ways, it undermined the church, and for Catholics, the Pope in dramatic ways. And France in particular was undergoing a period of anti-clericalism. The world so far away from Europe where they could find new converts and build new centers of power was in fact a way for them to increase the standing of their own institutions. The move to Vietnam specifically at this time was actually an attempt by France to counter the influence Britain had already accumulated in Asia. Great Britain already had more or less had control over the Chinese East Coast and was using its lucrative trade networks to accumulate massive amounts of capital and wealth trading with the metropolis cities there and the trade networks down the river valleys. The way the French government envisioned this domination was more or less an exclusive trade policy. The ability to be the sole or primary and controlling trade partner that Vietnam had with the outside world and allow them to monopolize the massive breadbasket agriculture and rice production of the Red River and Mekong River deltas. As we've discussed, given the decline of French civilization and the problems it was facing, France saw overseas colonization as the only real way to expand. On the continent, while it had once been been dominant for many centuries, the rise of Germany, the unification under the Prussians, more or less had led to France no longer being the dominant power in Western Europe. It 
had an actual continental opponent of equal size, and as a result, unable to expand territorially inside its own continent, it once more had to compete with Britain overseas. To this end, entities like the Marseille Chamber of Commerce actually said the goal of this whole expedition was to turn Saigon into a French Singapore, essentially wanting to compete with the great power of Britain in establishing these massive westernized trade capitals across the sea where merchants could accumulate great deal of wealth and control the flow of exotic and expensive goods out of these foreign holdings. At this period in the 19th century, it really did seem as though whereas formerly France and Britain had often been the two dominant powers competing in Europe with often Spain being their dominant power early on, really it was the British with their overseas empire and the unified Germans with their growing state who proved to be the two most dominant powers in continental Europe. Without some form of expansion, without some new direction, France was going to be doomed to be a second stringer power compared to these two. And more so, while Vietnam would be valuable, the rubber and the opium, as well as the massive rice harvest being a source of wealth, really France was also interested in China. As England had already shown, China had a tremendous amount of potential as a huge civilization and a former great power of previous eras. France had hoped that once establishing bases in Vietnam, it could exert influence and establish mercantile networks stretching to southern provinces of China. Of course, despite its obvious political and economic motives for this, France, as most imperial powers did at this time, felt the need to sort of justify why they were snapping up huge swaths of the globe. The French termed this, in a broader sense, the Mission Civilistrice, or the Mission of Civilization, or the Civilizing Mission, all connected pronunciations. The core concept of this was actually fairly simple, that the ideology that colonial powers had a duty to bring Western civilization to what they called backwards peoples, that rather than merely govern colonies, the colonizers had a mission, a duty almost to humanity to westernize and civilize these poor unfortunate to bring them the glories and improvements of Western civilization to basically assimilate the locals into their culture. The French and the Portuguese are the ones who actually most loudly discuss their mission of civilization, but in reality almost every imperial power has some version of this. The British, the Germans, the Americans, we all talk about this to some degree. Perhaps the most noted or at least most famous example of this sentiment was Rudyard Kipling's 1899 poem, The White Man's Burden. Well, some historians think he was less praising imperialism and more kind of mocking the U.S.'s attempts to get involved in it, but that's a discussion for a different day. This wasn't a new idea in a way. This idea of spreading the glories of European civilization, you could really trace that back to the old medieval Christian crusading and proselytizing tradition. You know, the need to, well, Charlemagne Christianizing the Saxons at sword point, or the crusades into Scandinavia or Eastern Europe, with ideas of Europe had a duty to spread its superior, in this case, religious culture, but its superior culture. By the 19th century, this becomes tied up in ideas like the social progress doctrine, social Darwinism in particular. For those of you not familiar with it, social Darwinism is a gross misinterpretation of evolutionary theory by applying it to social and political circumstance. In the context of the civilizing mission, the concept here was that, well, just as animals and species do in nature, nations compete for dominance, a sort of survival of the fittest on a political scale. Therefore, given the obvious superiority of their learning and technology and economic and industrial capacity, European civilization had proven itself to be the most advanced and therefore the most fit of civilizations in the world. Therefore, as the fittest of nations, less advanced or, quote, backwards peoples needed to abandon their primitive ways, to be forced to do so if necessary, and adapt and to adopt superior cultures if they were to survive. Indeed, to some European advocates of the civilizing mission, this was not just a duty of Western powers, but it was for the very good of the people they were assimilating, even if those who often suffered the burdens of assimilation would usually tend to disagree. In this sort of social Darwinism outlook, it's not that we're saying that, that all nations were on a playing field. It's obvious that some nations had developed, had gone through this industrial revolution, had more advanced armies, had more powerful bureaucratic systems, but it's more that they took the fact that they had accumulated that as some sort of inherent justification. It's essentially 
our government has the largest military, has the largest reach, and we have developed the most. Therefore, we have not only a right to do this, we have not only a right to impose ourselves, but we have a duty to do it. We are completely morally justified in overriding these other cultures. And all of this is, is very rich coming from that society. While Europe at that time might have went through the Industrial Revolution, the ideology this is based in, the ideology of proselytizing and crusades, if you crank it back to that actual period, these struggles between the East and the West over areas like the Middle East and Byzantium and Iberia and Spain, it is telling to note how much more literate, how much more scientifically advanced, how much more the Middle Eastern Arab culture, the Islamic culture, actually understood the writings of figures from Greek philosophy and of Roman thinkers. The Western civilization, only a few centuries before, was hardly the most civilized or advanced civilization, even in its own neighborhood, even that it was in contact with by its own standards. When the sort of final phase of French imperialism began under Napoleon III, there was talk of this, this idea of spreading French culture, spreading Christianity, all these sort of things. But during the reign of the Second French Empire, colonialism and imperialism really were more almost blatantly economic and political. France's attempts to reassert its dominance after the humiliation they had suffered in the Napoleonic Wars. But after the fall of the French Empire and the fall of Napoleon III and the Franco-Prussian War, France was still a colonial power and still pursued colonial policies for many years yet, but suddenly found itself in a much more difficult position. It needed, again, much as Napoleon III had realized, it needed to prove itself an international state after its humiliation by the recently formed German Empire. The man who will sort of be the architect of this, and the man who will really bring the mission of civilization into the forefront as part of French imperial policy is Jules Ferry, who rose to prominence as premier of France in 1880 after its defeat in the Franco-Prussian War, as the leader of a group known as the Opportunist Republicans. But they were actually a somewhat left-leaning faction that gradually grew more right-wing as they realized that anti-labor and anti-socialist sentiment was a great way to get votes. Long story short, Barry basically realized that imperialism would be an excellent way to both try to bolster a floundering French economy, as well as to reinforce a sense of French morale and hopefully regain France's, or at least maintain France's prominence in international affairs. And he laid this down in a speech he gave on March 28, 1884, before the Chamber of Deputies in Paris, where he declared, It is a right for the superior races to colonize because they have a duty. They have a duty to civilize the inferior races. Thus basically encapsulating the entirety of the mission of civilization in two quick sentences. There is at least a token attempt during his administration to live up to this policy in some ways. They made some noise about you know, incorporating co subject peoples as citizens of the French Empire. They talked about the idea of giving rights and privileges of citizenship to those people they colonized. This was always heavily dependent upon the idea that we would give citizenship and rights and privileges to the people who totally abandoned their own ways and culture and adopted French language and culture of their own, who collaborated essentially. So, in practice, this was really more window dressing to justify policy rather than a real serious attempt at anything. And equally ironic, the you know, next phase of French imperialism that Jules Ferry would set off would actually ultimately bring down his own career. And we'll get to this in due time, but when French troops were involved in wars in Vietnam and were forced to retreat from Lang Son, this led to him, his government being denounced, his policies being denounced, and ultimately him being forced from office on March 30th, 1885. And while technically it is his administration and government that you know, manages to wrangle the Chinese into a treaty that recognizes French sovereignty over Vietnam, at least central and southern Vietnam, he would never actually serve in French administration again, and very few even remember his name. And all this is not to say that there were not critics of this stated purpose, this, this ideological justification inside the French system itself. In fact, there were French statesmen and intellectuals who did see this wave of colonization as simply an outlet for the society, and without this outlet to put French excess population, the dregs of their society, their, to essentially release the flood valve, that it would lead to inevitable socialism. 
And in fact, opponents of the government at this time did call colonialism abandonment of social reform. Essentially, the idea is the French society taking this money and using it to fund military expeditions and expansion of trade and the establishment of these military outposts and bureaucracies. That was money that they weren't using to improve the lives of the average French citizen. While this mission of civilization might have been the justification might have been to increase the lot of people across the world and bring them in line with Western civilization. There were plenty of critics at home talking about the inequalities of that society. We're talking about the problems that France itself was facing, and France was instead ignoring them to pursue a policy of overseas expansion. Despite the apparent advantages that imperialism and colony holding offered, it didn't always work out quite that way in practice. And in some regions, like Vietnam, it seems that a little more than national pride rather than real profit would help the French there. An English observer in Saigon in 1879, Isabella Bird, said, France is doing its best to promote the prosperity and secure the goodwill of the native. The land tax has been lowered, municipal governments have been secured to native towns, and corporate and personal rights have been respected. The colony, far from being a source of profit for France, has kept at heavy loss. Just because your government has an ethnocentric policy doesn't necessarily mean it's a good ethnocentric policy. As has been previously said, the Vietnamese are, in this period, relatively unaffected by European colonialism. But, due to all the factors we've already talked about, they're somewhat open to them, somewhat weakened to the encroachment when it does arrive. Initially in the 18th century, Vietnam is not colonized by European powers, and instead the first contact they really have is when French Jesuit missionaries begin to enter South Vietnam. This corresponds to the time of period, as we've talked about, when the Mekong Delta and the areas of South Vietnam are still relatively new to being incorporated by the Vietnamese. These are areas still with closer ties for a much longer period historically, Champa and the Khmer areas and people. In addition to these missionaries, the Vietnamese did engage in trade with the European powers, primarily the Portuguese, the French, and the Dutch, and most notably for the firearms used in the wars of this era. Dynastic warring, peasant revolts, and Chinese invasions all led up to the general decline slash problems facing the dynasty and the Vietnamese local powers, leading to them being somewhat unprepared going forward. Eventually, the Nguyen dynasty of southern Vietnam actually did establish a more or less exclusive trade relationship with the French in exchange for their backing when they engaged in the reconquest of Vietnam. During their ascendancy and during the period of the Nguyen trying to consolidate power inside the Vietnamese region, they did face a number of revolts. The Catholics and the Chinese in the 1830s actually unified somewhat to oppose the Nguyen dynasty, leading to repression and internal crackdown, including executions. Execution of these Catholic missionaries led to the attention of Napoleon III, who was at that time trying to extend the influence of the French Empire, reconstituting the dynasty and the glory that his uncle had commanded under the French Empire of Napoleon I. And in 1858, his forces invaded Vietnam. The initial French forces were composed of 14 gunboats and 3,600 troops sent to South Vietnam, the area that the French would call Cochin, China, in 1858. These troops did not have to be dispatched all the way from France. They were already present in Asia, as France at this time was engaging alongside England in the Opium War in China. The French initially landed and seized the city of Nang and held it successfully, but were unable due to possibly the Vietnamese experience of the guerrilla warfare, as well as the unforgiving conditions, as well as the unfamiliar countryside and locals. They were unable to move beyond the confines of the city and were more or less stuck at that beachhead holding the Nang. Later, they attempted to open a secondary front, also landing at the South Vietnamese city of Saigon. Once again, however, they found themselves unable to move beyond the defensive perimeters of the city and were bogged down into that beachhead. Given the troubles they had pushing forward and the inability seemingly to make any headway in the Vietnamese country, the French attempted to seek peace treaty. The Vietnamese, however, seeing the situation more or less in their favor, having the French bottled up in two forts, rejected this and instead desired to push the French entirely out. Seeing this resistance to them and seeing their situation with two divided forces as unlikely to be successful, the French abandoned their foothold in the Nang and instead consolidated forces defending the city of Saigon in the south. In 1861, additional forces arrived from North China after they were no longer needed for fighting there. With these additional soldiers, they were able to expand out from Saigon and seize more and more territory from the Mekong Delta. 
This eventually led to a treaty between these two entities. The Treaty of Saigon established the free practice of Catholicism throughout Vietnam. It gave the French access to open trade all throughout the Mekong Delta, as well as trade in three ports on the Red River Delta in the north, and it ceded sections of South Vietnam to form what would be Cochin China. As well, the Vietnamese were forced to pay $1 million in reparations to the French for the war. The expansion of Vietnam is part of the second wave of French colonialism. France at this point had already suffered a notable decline and was attempting to more or less rebound into the modern era as one of the premier great powers in the world. Essentially, for most of the medieval period, France had been one of the, if not the most dominant power in mainland Europe. The entire period post-Roman collapse, at least ever since the reign of Charlemagne and the Frankish Empire, you have an equivalent to the predecessor of the modern French state. And throughout that time, they essentially were a dominant force militarily. They feuded with England on the coast and in territories that England held, like Gascony and Normandy. They fought with the Holy Roman Empire and had feuds with Austria. For going on a thousand years, France was undisputably the military superpower in mainland Europe. But leading up to this era, they had gone into a period of decline. Essentially, leading up to this period, Britain and France both competed for worldwide colonization. It initially started with the Portuguese and the Spanish establishing trade ports through Africa heading to India in order to monopolize the spice trade, but later led to the establishment of trade ports and then colonies and then the conquest of the Americas. Most notably in this period, in addition to a few Caribbean islands, the French had a section of India, which would later become the dominant and most important colony of the British Empire, but they also had vast swaths of North America, while the British, of course, had most of the 13 colonies along the coastline, the French had established large holdings of Canada going out from the settlement of Quebec. As well, they had Louisiana fur trade running through the Canadian territories linked with the Mississippi trade, which would head into the Gulf of Mexico. In the wars fought between these two powers, while France had been the dominant power, had always been the most massive and deadly force in the continent as far as military matters are concerned, Britain became the clear victor in the colonization game and in the field of naval warfare. With the loss of these colonies to England, England more or less had eclipsed France in this early modern era as the most dominant superpower in the world and the lean force of European colonization. With the state engaged in these massive wars and losing its position as the most dominant power in Europe, it led to a period of exhaustion and decline. The state was bankrupt, essentially racked with debt and unable to fund the projects it previously had. When mixed with a crop failure, it led to the French Revolution. It led to the downfall of traditional French government. And that period that represented a low point as far as international foreign projection power would go. France was racked with dissent rack within fine while the early European powers were able to continue unabated. From this revolution eventually came Napoleon, the first French empire, and that represented perhaps at that point a new height in French power. While they were not entirely able to reassert themselves and claim colonies outward, they were for a time it will dominate mainland Europe. Almost every nation in Europe was either occupied, a vassal, or an ally of France. But with the eventual defeat of Napoleon, and then his eventual second defeat at Waterloo, the French nation, once again, was entering a period of major decline. So, it's a familiar story. We've already heard of a few of these Vietnam dynasties that suffer internal struggle. The entire last series seemed like it was just one massive series of empires and dynasties fighting and eventually collapsing to newer contenders. So, in this case, France, but in the general case, why do empires tend to eventually collapse under their own weight? How can you go from being the most powerful empire in Europe, the most dominant nation, the most deadly military force in the continent, to being second place, to falling behind, to suffering into a revolution that completely upheaves your society? As we discussed in the Bronze Age Collapse section some episodes ago, the business of running a nation or an empire can be extremely expensive. After all, these various states, you know, in, in ancient history, are very small, but as time goes on, they become larger. Essentially, what they boil down to is this big collection of communities of peoples, whether it be villages that form city-states, or whether it be villages and towns and cities that form nations. It's the ability to pool manpower, to pool resources. And with these resources comes trade, and trade and resources comes wealth. The generation of wealth, the ability to use these resources to make raw materials and to use these raw materials to create finished 
products allows private individuals but also states to accomplish a number of things. It can be used for internal production. It can be used to fund, equip, and support standing armies on military campaigns. It can be used to give luxury to certain segments of a society, typically the upper class, sometimes a religious class, like a priestly class. If resources are lost, if trade routes are severed or tribute cannot be collected, if the wealth dries up in a society, especially a society that is used to a very large degree of it, whether it be an empire, some sort of extractor type nation, when it is unable to do the things it previously had, when the money goes away, then all of a sudden these sectors must give up their advantages. It's possible that all these sectors decline to some degree. The upper class loses some of its luxuries. Your army becomes smaller, your production shrinks. But in the case of many nations throughout history, in the case of France, in this case specifically, it wasn't a shared burden. It was a burden that typically fell more heavily onto some segments of the population. In this case, it'd be the peasantry, and less so on other segments of the population. In this case, the clergy and the nobility. More so inside these nations, especially militaristic nations, which in medieval Europe, that was basically every nation. The armies, the standing militaries can be used to fight for territory, can be used to extract resources, to colonize areas, to demand tribute, etc., etc. It can obviously become a route to power, as it did with France, and as naval military power became with Britain. When you have a massive army that consumes so much wealth, when the nation loses, when your army is taking all those costs, and those costs do not pay off and instead become a liability, that causes massive shortfalls in morale, it can cause depletion of manpower, and it can cause your resources, which at this time might be stressed, might be exhausted, to be even further exhausted and create an even more intense cycle of downfall. Into this steps Napoleon III. Napoleon III, the nephew of the more famous Napoleon Bonaparte, at this time is essentially trying to reestablish his uncle's regime. He's more or less coasting on the name and the reputation and the desire of France to regain some piece of its former glory and is trying to do that via international colonization, the thing that's worked so well for Britain. In this period is the scrabble for Africa. Africa is carved up by various European powers. They all claim chunks and some of those go to France. Notably, Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, big chunks of the Sahara, as well as other regions throughout the continent. In addition to the claiming of sections of Africa came the colonization of Vietnam. This initially started as a little enclave in Cochin, China, would grow to be a major French colony in Asia, an area which they already were looking at as a major strategic base in the Pacific for potential trade and naval operations. The later discovery of tin and rubber enriched the supplies here, only made it all the more desirable. And once they're in, the French actually made a killing off the opium sale. The difference between this wave of colonization by France and the earlier one, the colonization in Quebec and the colonization in New Orleans and the fur route and the trade down the Mississippi River is that in those instances there was a significant amount of emphasis placed on infrastructure and on development and actually trying to develop these sort of far-flung sort of colony nations, whereas in these it was much more about the immediate extraction of wealth. In the earlier period, France was still coming out of more or less the medieval period. It was still coming out of a time in which development of these towns will not represent possibly the best way to increase your power, to have these sort of, you know, satellite pseudo-nations. But in this time, the mid-19th century, industrialism is key. Capitalism has replaced feudalism, and it's no longer about establishing some far-flung society. It's about getting the materials and the resources you need for your factories, for your production. All things are kind of consumed by the new ability to take raw material and just quickly produce it in mass quantities for these large nations. In these areas, more so after the Vietnam, but Vietnam also suffered this, the French more or less, despite the fact that slavery had been outlawed, more or less used many locals as a de facto slave force. An interesting aspect of these encounters between the French and the Vietnamese is there are a number of Vietnamese who do end up joining the French and becoming part of these local institutions, more or less collaborators, they would be called. So the question becomes, especially in an area like Vietnam with this long history of resisting dynasties and resisting the Chinese and all these various things, why do some people collaborate, whether it be here or with, you know, the Germans in France, World War II, what have you? In many cases, especially in cases like the emperors of Vietnam, who would eventually become subjugated by the French and other local rulers, 
many people do tend to be somewhat inherently practical and honestly selfish. If given the choice between collaborating and finding a nation which you might well die, you might lose all your power, or someone comes to you and offers you the ability to be their rubber stamp and live in luxury and simply let them do what they wish, many regimes over time have taken that deal. As well, many collaborators also are people who weren't in power. There are many cases of opponents of old regimes or opportunistic people who see a chance to gain power or individuals who've been cast out of power taking revenge. Many of these times they're motivated by some sort of personal aims or personal goals. But some individuals do generally seek collaboration with outside elements. Some of them, in the case of much of Europe throughout World War II, whether it be German occupation or Soviet occupation later, some of them just align with them politically. They were not in power beforehand. When the new regime comes in, they essentially have been the new figureheads. But other times, groups will either see it as more convenient or even an opportunity to gain for their nation. In Vietnam and other areas that were colonies, typically what that meant when locals decided that there was value to be gained from working with the colonizers, it was things like Western education and what they would call civilization, air quotes, you know, and what would come with that. Some noted examples of this latter thinking in the case of Vietnam are men like Tong Chow and Tong De, who the latter was actually a member of the royal family, who both looked to Western education, especially technical education, science and math especially, and saw real advantages there, oftentimes pointing what they called the miracle of the rising sun, referring to Japan's rapid rise to power and industrialization. Others, perhaps a little more examples of multiple types of collaboration, is that Nguyen Van Vin, not a member of the royal family, in his case, who himself was a very disadvantaged individual who had only received education thanks to the missionary school and were very grateful for these opportunities, but also believed that, well, if Vietnam had been willing to learn from, adapt, study, and use Chinese culture, which was foreign to them a thousand years ago, then why not study what was clearly a stronger nation and learn from it and throw off what he saw as old and backwards ideas to embrace new ones? The West at this point had obviously a more comprehensive scientific understanding of the world. There were advances being made there, which obviously would have been possible if not for the advances made in the Islamic world during the medieval period. It's not as though the West had some sort of inherent monopoly on this, but there were things that the Vietnamese people did not yet have implemented into their educational system. There were ideas that were foreign to them, and there was advantage, at least as far as some people saw, in adopting and perhaps modifying some of these, at least to where degree would be useful in Vietnam. The problem, of course, arises in these situations. It's not like, say, an assimilation pattern in the United States where immigrants decide to come to the United States and they become part of the culture and a little bit of their culture gets rubbed off. Colonialism is about a settler culture. It's about a culture arriving there and imposing itself on locals. The French largely were not taking much of the Vietnamese. Of course, there's a, usually the few culinary dishes and maybe a few trends and luxuries that might come back and be an exquisite foreign thing in the, in the native culture, but the French were not going to adopt any sort of Vietnamese cultural or political or societal practices, but they may well insist or expect the Vietnamese to do the same for the French. This sort of coercive sort of statecraft where one society more or less brands itself as explicitly better, as explicitly dominant, it's basically coercive. It leads to resentment and leads to the violence and the rebellion that we'll see coming in the later period. The British especially had a practice in many of their colonies in Africa of note where the British would kind of adopt a local group to be their sort of designated collaborationists. Oftentimes it'd be sort of a smaller minority community who, you know, would often adopt some of these practices. They'd become a little more Western, a little more Christian, and they would often get all the good jobs in the administration. They'd be sort of the local people propped up to make the locals hate them and not so much hate the British. And so eventually, once the British left, a huge amount of these decolonial wars and conflicts that happened throughout the Third World really have to assort of these majority groups who were always out of favor, finally desiring to have some real political control over their future and their communities, clash with these smaller sort of collaborationist groups who often had become the new leaders of their nation, or instead were leaving a breakaway nation that was further developed and richer than the larger neighboring nation. Following the signing of the Treaty of Saigon, the Vietnamese Emperor Tu Duc experienced himself a downfall, essentially humiliation of the French taking part of Vietnam, as well as the general disruption of the country, as well as spilling over bandits from the failed Taiping Rebellion in China. 
led to the countryside of North Vietnam, the area that would later be called Tonkin, in disarray. The area was rife with criminal elements as well as dissident Catholics who originally had ties to the French. Following the initial defeats that had occurred in the Cochin China campaign, a militia army was organized in the south led by one of these Mandarin elites, a Truong Den, who did incorporate elements to defeat the Vietnamese National Army into it and continued to resist the French even after the peace was established. One of his main lieutenants, a fisherman and partisan leader by the name of Nguyen Trung Truk, also participated, and he led one of their most noble attacks. The partisan attacks throughout South Vietnam against the various French elements eventually led to the boarding and then burning of a French transport ship, the La Esperance. Essentially, Nguyen Trung Truk and his men approached them on smaller fishing vessels pertaining to be rice merchants. After boring, they burned the vessel. The capture and then destruction of such a vessel actually did boost parts of morale and gave them some strength to continue their struggle. Officially, however, after the peace treaty was signed, the Emperor of Vietnam, Tuduk, or the army disbanded. However, the Mandarin, Din, refused and continued the fight. This rebel, the Gyeong Trung Truk, did leave some writings, one of which reads, The Emperor rules Vietnam. Our destiny has been written in the soil of our country. The Chinese were defeated. How dare you bandage trespass on our land? You shall meet your undoing by our hands. You cannot put a western mask on an eastern face. While partisan attacks continued and the guerrilla campaign aimed at bringing down the French and hampering their efforts in the peninsula was somewhat successful in its initial years, eventually in 1864, its leaders were killed. The French besieged the fortress of Qian Zhang, and after capturing it, they executed the leader, the Gyeong Trung Truk. Truong Dien also killed himself with his sword after the French routed his troops and he was facing capture in the same year. After Truong Din's death, his son, Truong Kien, continued the struggle, but he was also killed in 1867. The Emperor of Vietnam, despite having told them to stand down signing the peace treaty, which he had done hoping that they could diplomatically eventually return his lands and he could eventually use some means beyond these struggles to oust the French, publicly stated his admiration for Nguyen Trung Truk and also gave allowances to Truong Din's widow after his death. The French used these, as well as other propaganda, to claim that Chu Duc had violated the treaty, had supported these guerrillas, and used it as a justification to seize three more provinces from them in 1867. Frederick Bory, France's minister of China, had attempted a diplomatic solution between the two great powers, proposing a treaty which would divide Vietnam between Chinese and French spheres of influence, which the Qing government itself agreed to. Jules Ferry, having just ascended to the prime ministership of France, however, preferred the aggressive mission of civilization through use of military might and Western industry. But had things gone differently, the two major powers may have just divided Vietnam between themselves nearly a century before similar events happened during the early Cold War. The French Empire would use the guerrilla campaigns waged against them to justify seizing more territory from the Vietnamese, and disputes involving French business interests would be the pretext for Jules Ferry's government's dispatching of an exploratory military expedition into the northern Tonkin region under the command of a naval captain, Henry Riviere, in 1881, while also recalling Boree. On April 25, 1882, Riviere and his men seized the Hanoi Citadel, and its commander, Hoang De, committed suicide after sending his apologies to the emperor. While in the city, Captain Riviere encountered placards distributed by Liu Yong Fu, commander of the Black Flag Army. These were challenging the French forces to meet the outlaw force, the Black Flag Army, in the field of battle. At the same time, with the prospect of increasing French military involvement in Southeast Asia, Qing Chinese soldiers began crossing the border to occupy and fortify settlements in North Vietnam's border. At the same time, they began arming and providing support for the former enemies, the Black Flag Army. Ultimately, at this stage in history, Vietnam was merely a stepping stone for France to contest British commercial dominance in Asia, and Vietnam was poised to be the battlefield between its traditional imperial overlords and its new European taskmaster. In the mid-19th century, an event occurring in southern China called the Taiping Rebellion is going to have significant consequences for sort of the next wave of violence to occur in Vietnam during this period. The Taiping Rebellion itself is a very significant event in the latter history of the Qing Dynasty of China. It occurs roughly between the years 1850 and 1864. Now, the roots of this rebellion go back to the 1842 Opium War and China's rather humiliating loss 
that occur, as well as the unequal treaties they were forced to sign, the indemnities they were required to pay, and the general sort of humiliation of the military that occurred. As a result of this war, the government had been forced to collect much higher taxes and land rents to both pay for the loss itself, as well as the harsh indemnities imposed upon them by the British and other powers. This, of course, led to increased poverty and land abandonment by the peasantry. At the same time, China is seeing a significant spike in its growth population. This combined with the agricultural stagnation of the period and the land abandonment caused by taxation raises some serious fears of famine. And that central government can really do nothing about this. Again, a combination of the cost of the opium war and the peace that resulted from it, as well as a massive trade imbalance that's being caused by the opium trade itself, means that there really aren't any secure national finances, and thus the problem just sort of festers. As a result, as is often the case in periods of instability in China, you see a rise in banditry in the countryside as peasants who abandon their lands turn to their swords as best they can. Numerous secret societies, both religious and political, begin to form, and some of the more prominent and powerful individuals, either to protect their own investments or to seek more direct changes, begin forming private armies, which are, of course, very much illegal. In addition to this, a lot of these private armies and secret societies had a very strong anti-dynastic slant. Specifically anti-Qing and anti-Manchu, seeing the dynasty crumble, seeing it fail to protect the people, and of course, castigating the emperors as foreigners, as non-Han Chinese, which technically they were. So in the midst of all of this unrest and general malaise, emerges the future leader of the Taiping Rebellion, Hong Zikong. Now, who is this man? Well, he is a man of some means, comes from a family of some prominence in southern China. He was familiar with Western powers through time spent in places like Canton and Macau, and he was one of these many young Chinese men who dreamed of a future in the bureaucracy, of taking the civil service test and becoming a Mandarin. But he failed in his exams and thus was not allowed entry, as the vast majority of candidates did. So, somewhat rudderless, he begins to wander, and in 1837, before the Opie War even happens, he falls very ill, like almost deathly ill. He does survive this, but when he comes out of this period of sickness, he claims to have received a vision, what most would charitably call a fever dream, but he was very convinced that something, some power, some spirit, something had spoken to him. And he spends the next five or so years pondering this vision that he had received. And ultimately, it is through studying basically a variety of Christian literature that he has received from missionaries in southern China that he, in 1843, finally puts the pieces together and announces to the world, or at least to the few people listening to him, that he has received a vision from God, the Christian God, no less, and that in this vision, Hong had been told that he was the younger brother of Jesus, sent to earth to bring about the heavenly kingdom of peace. And while there is certainly a strong Christian core to the philosophy he begins to form, he is definitely putting his own very unique slant on it. He's fusing a lot of Taoist mysticism into this. He incorporates a lot of Confucian social and political thought. There's also a strong dose of what we'd call millenarianism. Sort of, he's the second coming of Christ, basically. The end of the world must be at hand. And this at first evolves into a pseudo-secret society called the God-Worshipping Society, later sort of gets codified into what's called Taiping Christianity. And Hong and a few of his brothers essentially begin using this philosophy to proselytize and recruit for what is essentially their own private army. Now, at first, they don't use this army for any particularly nefarious means. In fact, Hong and his followers gain a great deal of support among local peasants because they use their private army to suppress bandits in the region and basically help to stabilize the area they were operating in. So, even if I imagine a lot of people at first thought his beliefs were strange, they certainly liked what he was doing, and many converts came to him because, well... Hong seems to be doing the job of the emperor for him, and if Hong is talking about the need to form a new dynasty and a new kingdom and a new philosophy, well, the instability of the times so to bear that out. Of course, whatever his motives, whatever his philosophy, he is seen as an anti-government rebel, and the Qing authorities order his the suppression of the Taiping. And around 1850, open clashes begin, and the ad hoc army that 
Huang Zekuan had built actually wins some of these early clashes, though they are also forced to operate very much like a guerrilla army, operating out of the countryside, hiding, striking from ambush. But they begin to pick up steam and converts, and their inability of the Qing armies, one of the greatest armies in the world, according to the dynasty, inability to stop him only snowballs the effect and brings more into his camp. On January 11th of 1850, Huang Zekuan declares himself the heavenly king of the great kingdom of heavenly peace, or the Taiping kingdom, as many refer to it. Now, at first, this declaration is little more than the grandiose you know, statements of this cult leader, but a combination of strong anti-Qing sentiments in the region, the fact that he was sort of seen as a champion of the common people, a man who was trying to address the suffering of peasants and farmers, as well as a number of criminal triads who felt that the Taipings would be an excellent foil to basically distract or destroy government power in the region, thus allowing them to gain a further foothold. All of this support basically combines over the next few years of the Taiping basically carving a state for themselves around the Yangtze River. In 1853, they take the city of Nanjing, and Hong claims this as capital, renaming it Tianjing. Now, this, the city of Tianjing and the surrounding areas of the Yangtze River are always going to be the core of this Taiping kingdom, but it will expand considerably over the next few years, and it's estimated that at its height, some 30 million people live within this rebel territory. Now, on the surface, Hong is sort of ruling as an emperor of a new Chinese government, a new dynasty. He's definitely adopting many Confucian elements, but his politics and the policies of his state are definitely atypical for many Chinese dynasties, even, even rebel dynasties. A lot of it is traditionalist, but there are a lot of socialist elements copied from Western thought in his policies, and a large gloss of his own unique form of Christianity. For one thing, Hong championed land reform. He insisted upon distributing land equitably among his subjects. Technically, this is supported by the so-called well field system that was supposedly used in the legendary first dynasty of China. But again, a lot of socialist rhetoric is being used around this. In addition to this, there is some talk of equality between classes and equality of sexes based upon Christian doctrines and the idea of enforcing monogamy and ending the system of concubinage, these sorts of things. So there's definitely some of Western elements and ideas here too that, again, do gain a fair amount of support among common people. Land, equality, less power for landowners and mandarins, it all seems pretty good. Of course, one doesn't need to look too far to realize this was basically a surface gloss and something else. At the highest levels, the hypocrisy kind of reveals itself. Hong himself kept a whole harem of concubines, and the leadership caste of the Taiping are still very much a feudal caste who are controlling absolute power in this state, and more than that, at the highest levels behind closed doors, there's a lot of politics and corruption in fighting. It's not exactly the great kingdom of heavenly peace, despite what Huang Zikuan might claim. Still, the Taiping had felt confident enough in their victories and in their beliefs that they actually approached a number of Western powers in hopes of gaining recognition and support. And there was talk in Europe about potentially supporting the Taiping. There were those who said that, well, you know, supporting the rise of a Christian dynasty in China might have advantages later on, and if we have helped Hong establish himself as the new ruler of China, well, he's got a lot of favors for us. But ultimately, everyone kind of decides not to support the Taiping, really for two reasons. One, there's no guarantee that the Taiping will give them a better deal than what he got. They had treaties that the Western powers very much liked with the Qing, and so propping up that dynasty seemed perhaps a safer bet. In addition, once Westerners actually went into this region, actually looked at the Taiping, the reports that came back were that they're Christian only by the loosest technical sense of the word, and the openly socialist bent of some of their rhetoric really turns off the powers that be in Europe, and so ultimately nobody really decides to aid the Taiping in their efforts. Nonetheless, despite this, the Taiping continue on, and by 1860 their kingdom expands considerably. A number of battles are fought again along the Yangtze River, and Qing forces are subject to several humiliating defeats, and I think the reasons for this are actually fairly straightforward. One, 
the Chinese military was kind of an all-time low in terms of morale. The Opium War had really damaged the military system in China at this time. And on top of this, the government is so strapped for cash. It is so poor. It is so desperate. It is struggling very hard to play off foreign powers, to maintain some sovereignty. There's just not the resources available to do this. These armies are fighting. Some are not being paid. Loyalty of the dynasty is very weak. Morale is low. It's just not a good situation. The Taiping victories actually make a great deal of sense in this context. Nonetheless, the defeats and the mass expansion of the Taiping Kingdom in 1860 convinced the Qing they had to do something. They decided to begin taking desperate measures. If the Central Army, if the great flag divisions of the Qing Army are unable to win, then perhaps there's another way. You see, there had been a long-standing policy in among the Qing and other dynasties that no high Mandarin should ever be allowed to serve in his home province for fear that he might develop into that power base. It's also the idea that there should be no military force in the country other than that of the Dai itself. In desperation, the Qing basically allow regional Mandarins to begin raising private armies to fight the Taiping. Among the most successful and famed of these are the so-called Yang army of Zheng Guofan, who was also allowed to take control of his home province and build his army using his personal connections and family influence. Now, there were some who felt this is dangerous, but they also felt there was very little choice at this time. By this point, many Western powers are also giving aid to the Qing as well in hopes of maintaining their treaties. There are a number of Western advisors who are essentially helping to modernize certain Qing groups. In fact, there's an army called the Ever Victorious Army, which is basically organized along Western lines and being effectively led by Western military advisors at this point. The result of these essentially dynasty-supported local warlords, as well as a westernized central army, allows them to go on the offensive in 1862. By this point, the tide begins to turn pretty drastically. While the Taiping were enthusiastic, there were no great military minds among them, and their armies were relatively primitive. You know, large bands of peasants who were ill-equipped and basically fighting on morale and fanaticism. At this point, again, the infighting among Taiping leadership has also begun to dissolve some of their base support as well. So between 1862 and 1864, the Qing forces begin to advance down the Yangtze River and begin to inflict some serious defeats upon Taiping forces. In May of 1862, the Yang army wins a major battle, capturing the city of Anqing and threatening Nanjing itself. In fact, they begin to lay siege to the city in May of that year, although this siege will last two years. So even with the modern Western equipment, it's still a tough nut to crack. And the Taiping Rebellion really only loses, or really only is defeated in June of 1864 when Huang Zikuan dies of food poisoning, which is, I suppose, not too surprising in a city that's under siege for two years, but as soon as Hong dies, immediately the leadership fragments between those who support his son as the next emperor, his brothers, other military commanders, and in the wake of the political chaos that erupted, the Xiang army broke through the walls and took the city, and the vast majority of the Taiping leadership was put to the sword. When Nanjing fell, the heart was torn out of the rebellion, and most Taiping armies put down their swords. Although even here, not much mercy was given. Large numbers of rebels were executed, and those rebel commanders that were captured were subject to some truly horrific executions. At the final tally, the Taiping Rebellion actually ranks, even today, as one of the bloodiest wars in human history. It is the bloodiest civil war in human history and is one of the largest conflicts of the 19th century. We don't have exact numbers because exact counts weren't kept, but estimates place the number of dead on both the Taiping and Qing side between 10 and 30 million. In addition to this, we estimate 30 million refugees were created by the conflict in addition to that. And to make things even worse, while most Taiping armies were either crushed or surrendered in 1864, some took the hills and mountains and jungles and kept fighting as guerrilla bands till the 1870s. Others, perhaps more destructive, basically fragmented, many drifted beyond the borders of their countries, and basically became bandit groups who were referred to as the flag gangs, who would be a thorn in the side of many nations for years to come.
At this stage of Vietnamese history, a very noble force is the Black Flag Army. The Black Flag and Army initially started as a force of roughly 200 men led by Liu Yang Fu as part of a larger bandit force operating in South China in the Yangtze region, which later defected to a different bandit force led by Wu Yanqing. There are varying reports as to whether or not the Black Flag Army had been part of the Taiping Rebellion, but several sources I see indicate they were not actually that. They were instead operating as a bandit. Though, it is possible that some of them were survivors, some of them might have been deserters or remnants of armies that had been destroyed, and the leader, Wu Yanqing, and his son, Wu Yanchung, also claimed to be Taiping princes. The Chinese Qing forces systematically destroyed the bandit armies of the area following the Taiping Rebellion and defeat. The Black Flag Army, which had been operating in South China, crossed into Tonkin in 1865. The Black Flag Army set up shop and harassed the northern areas and controlled swaths of the countryside, but over time it became part of the background of North Vietnam, and actually it reached accommodations with the power structure in Hue. They proved their usefulness to the Gian Dynasty by suppressing the mountain tribes of North Vietnam. The leader of the Black Flag Army, Liu Yang Fu, established an extortion network, a racket of taxing, air quotes, between the areas of Son Tae and Liao Cai, central North Vietnam to central west border with China. The profits were so great that the bandit army swelled its ranks in 1870s to 7,000. The bulk were Chinese, but they also include foreign mercenaries who fought among them, including European and American officers who had fought in the Taiping Rebellion. The Black Flag Army had encountered the French before, in 1873, they had killed Francis Garnier and the force under his command outside the walls of Hanoi. Now, Liu Yang Fu was issuing challenges for Riviere to fight him and his bandit army. At dawn, May 19th, Riviere departed Hanoi with 450 Marines, two companies, and three guns to find and destroy the Black Flag Army. Unfortunately for him, Liu Yang Fu had spies throughout the city. After the moment they left, the Black Flag Army was following their advance and preparing an ambush. At 7.30, they arrived at Kiao Gai, or Paper Bridge, named after a local paper mill there, where the Black Flag troops waited across from them in the villages of Throng Han Hanyan Ki, and Thien Thong, and the dense bamboo forest there also hid their presence. As the French column moved across the bridge, their vanguard was attacked by Black Flag skirmishers. Major de Villers, who had had previous success at the Battle of Yai Kuk, commanded the troops and began a full frontal attack. Once the French were fully committed to battle, Liu Yang Fu sent in his reserve and began to overwhelm the smaller French contingent. Major de Villers was mortally wounded in these forced moves. Before being overrun, Captain Riviere took command and began to withdraw in good order across the bridge, until one of his artillery pieces turned over. Trying to rescue the crew, Riviere and his aides were wounded, and their lines were overrun by the Black Flag attack. A junior officer led the survivors to hold a dike for some time before falling back to Hanoi. The Black Flag Army had suffered 50 dead and 56 wounded, and the French 35 killed and 52 wounded. This would prompt France to dispatch reinforcements to avenge this defeat, thus beginning the Tonkin Campaign. French gunboats arrived with additional soldiers and opened fire on Vietnamese positions on August 20th. Near Hue, the flotilla bombarded forts and guns and ultimately killed or wounded 2,500 Vietnamese. With this, Admiral Corbet was able to force the Vietnamese government to accept the Treaty of Hue on August 25th. This would recognize French coaching China and also turn Tonkin and Annam into protectorates in exchange for canceling Vietnam's debt to their new overlords. They would also engage in a campaign to evict the Black Flag Army from North Vietnam. It was presented as a concession, but really the French had intended to do that anyway. The Tonkin Expeditionary Corps would clash indecisively with the Black Flags again at Phue Hoi on August 15th and Palan on September 1st. On August 13th, French forces captured the citadel of Hai Du Oong, where they discovered French prisoners and their Vietnamese allies who had been tortured to death. In response, the soldiers executed the Vietnamese wounded. While violent, none of these battles made a decisive impact on the course of the conflict. With the government of Vietnam officially withdrawn from the conflict, French soldiers moved north against Black Flag strongholds and the Chinese regulars operating their country. 
Corbet moved against the city of Sante, which was garrisoned by 7,000 Vietnamese regulars cooperating with 3,000 men from the Black Flag Army, led once more by Liu Yong Fu and 2,000 Chinese regulars. In response, France had brought 9,000 soldiers, infantry, marines, foreign legion, and local Vietnamese troops. Rather than commit battle in the open, both sides locked in for a siege. The city hosted a citadel in the style of French-built fortifications observed in Cochin, China, and the Black Flag forces could further strengthen their defenses with bamboo palisades and moats. After an initial round of costly attack and counterattack on December 14th, French forces locked into a withering bombardment on December 16th. By 5 p.m., Liu Yongfu and his Black Flag troops withdrew to the citadel and surrendered the Arab defenses. Within hours, they abandoned the city to the French. Liu Yongfu blamed his his allies. Believing the Vietnamese and Chinese regulars left the Black Flag to do all the fighting and get massacred. This rift would disrupt the working alliance that had been present, and for a time, at least, the Black Flags would dissolve into the countryside as a raider bandit force once more. On December 16th, Major General Charles Theodore Millet arrives with fresh troops from France and Africa. While Vietnam was set to become France's naval base abroad, and in fact, many of the officials of the colonial administration would have passed with the Navy, Algeria was already being crafted into the center of France's colonial army affairs. Many colonial powers would in time utilize NATO troops. In this case, and in the future, the French army would call on many Africans and Vietnamese to help them in conquering, occupying, and pacifying the region. The British Empire as well made extensive use of NATO troops, outsourcing to different colonial regions. In a realistic sense, you're recruiting potential rebels in their home countries, offering them steady pay and possibly some sort of societal advancement among the colonial overlords, and outsourcing them to fight in regions which they lack sympathies and ties unlike auxiliaries patrolling their own country. In March 1884, during the Bac Ninh campaign, Millet's French forces came into direct conflict with the Chinese soldiers of the Guangxi army. Flanking their pre-planned defenses, the entire Chinese force was routed. Morale in the army was low, and many officers refused to cooperate with one another and come to each other's assistance. The more seasoned black flag troops had stayed out of the heart of the fighting. 20,000 soldiers fled from the battlefield and surrendered the city to the French. One month later, Millet moved against the Black Flag Army in their prepared defenses at Huang Ho. Rather than even attempting preliminary assaults, the French instead battered the position with heavy guns for hours. Once infantry began to move to take the town, the Black Flag Army set fire to the remains and fled. Following the humiliating defeats and abandonment of their Black Flag proxies, Chinese moderates in the Qing court were able to reach an agreement with France. With the Tonkin region, more or less in the possession of French forces, they secured a ceasefire agreement with the Qing and moved to secure the border between their newest conquest and China. June 23, 1884, a French column under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Alphonse Dugin crossed the Song Thuong River in order to occupy the town of Leng Song near the Chinese border. Chinese regulars holding defensive positions nearby opened fire, possibly as a warning shot, leading to minor skirmishing. Messages were exchanged, and the Qing commander was aware of the ceasefire, but had not been ordered to move. He requested Colonel Dugin to contact his superiors. Instead, the French officer decided he would resume his march in one hour's time after informing the Chinese. As they began to move, Chinese forces shadowed them. However, when one group of cavalry moved toward the front of the column, they opened fire. Outnumbered five to one, the French were forced to flee rather than be encircled without artillery support. The ambush at Bac Ninh is still debated to this day, but what is important for the purpose of this story, French public opinion turned toward retribution after the Chinese refused to pay indemnities. This brought both powers into direct conflict, a continuation of the prior fighting known as the Sino-French War. The French Navy was deployed to the region, and they actually attacked Formosa, or Taiwan, and landed Marines on it, and blockaded the island, while well, they actually devastated some Chinese fleets along the mainland coast. The Chinese actually had organized a force to invade Vietnam through a land invasion, but the French were able to beat them back from the border and establish forward bases in order to safeguard that region. However, Chinese soldiers and black flag troops alike continued to harass them and strain the supply lines in North Vietnam. At the the costly sieges of Lang Son and Nui Ba, the French defeated Chinese forces. As the war continued, the French actually deployed their navy along the Yangtze River. 
blockadeant. Their aim was to provoke a rice shortage, hoping that starvation would actually strangle the reinforcements and force the Chinese to the negotiating table and to call off their attempts to invade the country. Meanwhile, French ground forces had actually reconsolidated along the border and pushed northward. The Battle of Bangbo, or as the Chinese sources call it, Xenon Pass, was an unsuccessful attempt by Francis Oscar de Negre and 1,600 French soldiers to push across the border and take the fight into South China. Unfortunately for them, they fought a far numerically superior foe. The French spies noted how many company flags arrived at Liang Zhao as the Guangxi army built its strength for battle and reported they had 40,000 soldiers under arms. How However, they estimated that each was at full strength, when in reality they were anything but. Chinese sources say 16,000, including black flag troops, were once more brought to battle, but other modern sources place this number at 25 to 30,000. Regardless, they were highly outnumbered. After an unsuccessful initial raid by Chinese forces under the command of Feng Jikai, De Negre counterattacked immediately upon arrival, hoping to catch Chinese forces unready. On the 23rd of March, he arrived with roughly 1,600 men and 10 guns and attacked before the arrival of reinforcements, hoping to seize the initiative. The attack called for an encirclement two-sided strike on prepared defenses around the village of Bangbo. However, the French group, intending to strike at the rear of their lines, led by Colonel Herbinger, got lost during its march in thick fog. Negre, believing a group of Chinese reinforcements to be Herbinger's soldiers, ordered his frontal attack to begin. The French soldiers rushed the trench lines and took fire both from those troops holding it and from flanking positions along a hillside. When the 111th Battalion fled, the Chinese pursuers stopped to loot the abandoned French haversacks and finish off the wounded, which allowed the French to to fully withdraw. The secondary attack did move in and take a single Chinese fort hours after the intended operation. The Chinese counterattack surrounded this group and cut them off. Herbinger ordered the cut off 143rd Battalion to be abandoned to their fate, but Captain Patrick Cotter of the 2nd Foreign Legion Battalion ignored orders to liberate them and flee from the Chinese lines. General de Negre took command of the French rearguard, which covered the retreat, and the force was able to avoid a total rout. Morale and discipline wore thin, and the officers were forced to return to Ling Son rather than face disaster. In Europe, politicians began to question the wisdom of these military expeditions once word arrived of their defeats. Back in Ling Son, despite conditions, the French were once more in the defensive and able to fight against the disorganized Chinese attacks. At K. Liyua, Herbinger was ordered to attack the cumbersome Chinese advance. With artillery support, the attack completely rounded the advance and sent them into a full retreat. During the engagement, however, De Negre was wounded in the chest and had to hand command over to Herbinger. One small note, if it sounds like the French commander has an inappropriate name, well, Negre seems to translate to slaver. Make of that what you will. Lieutenant Colonel Herbinger, despite successes in the Franco-Prussian War, already had a string of complaints and detractors among his junior officers, not to mention his bungling at the Battle of Bengbo. Upon attaining command, Herbinger worried that Lang Son itself was about to be surrounded by Chinese and put under siege. Herbinger would claim he did not have enough ammunition to fight a second battle of Lang Son, which appears to have been untrue, and ordered a general retreat, including throwing their heavy guns and the treasury into the river. The artillery, at least, were later recovered by the Chinese army. He then cut the telegram line after sending his warning south so that he could not be countermanded. This ended up disconcerting the South Vietnamese garrisons of the French, who believed that a massive Chinese beige army must be on its way and sent a letter back to France. His soldiers, whose morale had recovered after routing a much larger foe to whom they had already lost, were shocked to learn they were abandoning the fort. Once it was established what had occurred, his commander, Louis Briere de Ile, the same man who had sent dire warnings to Paris, ordered Herbinger to hold position. Herbinger, for his part, remained alarmist and believed they were playing into Chinese hands. After cavalry patrols warned of Chinese scouting parties, Herbinger sent back more frantic warnings and became increasingly convinced they would be overrun and destroyed as night went on. After a false alarm and gunshots the next morning, Herbinger would tell one of his officers, quote, I'm sick, and the column is just as sick as me. Leave me alone, unquote. 
Truly inspiring words, I imagine, for the soldiers within earshot. He only became active once Le'il gave him permission to retreat even further away. To be fair, it seems probable that he may have had malaria during the expedition, which is never a good trait to acquire in Crusader games. I would make a joke about the French military ability, but that's entire trope with little actual basis in fact given the centuries France spent as a continental powerhouse. I could make a joke about colonial air armies having a good deal of upper class morons amongst their ranks, and while true, would stigmatize the past I think a little too much when even today, plenty of cowards and idiots are given command and responsibility over the lives of others. While on retreat, Herbinger ordered more of his guns destroyed, but his orders were ignored by lower-ranking officers who brought them back without slowing the column down. Once reinforcements arrived, his men expected Herbinger to go on the attack against Chinese skirmishers. Instead, the retreat continued. Among them, Captain LeCompte later wrote, We were tired of echelons like this for 10 kilometers, 3,000 Frenchmen running away from 40 Chinese, unquote. All the while the retreat was going on, the bulk of the Chinese forces had retreated back to the fortifications of Bang Bo. Once Vietnamese sympathizers brought them the intel about the full French retreat, only then did the Guangxi army leave their lines to occupy Leng Son. Through all the bloodshed of the Leng Son campaign, the Chinese army was where it had initially began. Meanwhile, back in Paris, the disastrous report sent back by General Le Il had reversed political opinion, and Jules Ferry's opponents, including Clemenceau, future Prime Minister during World War I, as well as many other posts throughout the French government throughout his many years. If you see pictures from the negotiation to Versailles, he's the mustachioed Monopoly man there. All of this brought public opinion down upon their heads. The expedition and failures were compared unfavorably to Napoleon III's ill-conceived Mexican adventures. Years before, hoping to install a friendly monarch in the Western Hemisphere, the French Empire had backed the reign of Maximilian I of the House of Habsburg. Such a government was racked by political and an outright fighting between the conservative elements, which favored monarchy in Europe, and the liberals, who favored democracy in the United States. Between 1861 and 1867, France intervened, and the pro-monarch side suffered 57,000 dead, including Maximilian, who was executed at the end of the Civil War. This was enough to unseat Ferry's government, and lead to a peace treaty between the French and the Chinese. The second telegram Leil sent was more optimistic, and Ferry prepared to send more troops, but a vote of no confidence and public outrage unseated him. Ferry would go on to have limited political influence throughout the rest of his life. China, meanwhile, was exhausted by the naval campaign and wary of possible Japanese aggression. The Treaty of Tietzen recognized French control over Tonkin while dropping the issue of compensation over the ambush at Bak Li. Le'il attempted to try Herbinger for his conduct during the campaign. Reports surfaced that Herbinger believed he had failed and he wished to get himself killed in Mao to redeem his mistakes. Le'il accused Herbinger of being drunk when he made his orders, and Herbinger accused the Tonkin officers of conspiring against him as a metropolitan officer and alleged that de Negre had made the initial fatal mistake of attacking Bang Bo while his troops were unready. Paris brought an early end to the inquiry, fearing the controversies might erupt further from this. Herbinger was given no punishment or recommended to never hold command again. Strangely, he died the next year at the age of 46. One final note about this series of events, there does seem to be a Chinese movie partially about them called The War of Lung. I found clips of it on YouTube under the name of The Battle of Zanan Pass. On first glance, it seems to be fairly interesting, but I'm not an expert in uniforms and like to judge if they actually got any of that correct for the time period. But I did like how much of a scrawny nerd they cast Lee Herbinger, which I suppose is appropriate, and I was quite surprised when the Chinese won the battle via fire dragon thing? To be fair to Herbinger, if I had to actually fight a mythical beast, I might have had some sort of nervous breakdown too. I may be trying to track down a sub of that movie. If anyone knows anything, tell us about in the comments. France established a peace treaty with China. Even with this done, with the border established and the French able to try to reconsolidate control, the Black Flag insurgency under those Taiping surviving bandits actually continued for some years after and took years to pacify the Tonkin region. Sort of the first signs of how difficult it would be for the French in years to come when more and more forces would dedicate, you know, mass amounts of resources, supplies, and lives to resisting them. 
During the occupation of Vietnam, General Rossel de Corsi was dispatched to Vietnam to take command of their interests in Tonkin and deal with the courts. This being despite, or perhaps specifically because, of de Corsi's rugged and undiplomatic manner. His first introduction to the court was threatened to have one of the Child King's advisors arrested for not coming to the meeting due to him being ill. He then demanded that the Confucian rites be ignored so that French soldiers could proceed through one of the central gates of the city rather than a side gate. And then he was explicit that the Vietnamese emperor come down off of his throne to greet him. Things that seem pointless to us now, I imagine, but at the time, these were traditions, which the conservative mandarins had been clinging to for centuries. Wherever talk there may have been of trying to win back their country through diplomacy must have seemed hollow when a French general demanded the emperor treat with him as an equal. There is certainly reason to imagine a pro-colonial government dispatching their most tactless flag officer to deal with the Vietnamese, fishing for a reason to crack the whip, perhaps. All this resulted in hostilities breaking into the open around Hue. Mandarins of the court had removed and killed multiple child kings, who wielded the majority of the government's power. Ton That Thiet and Nguyen Van Thuong, in particular, organized an attack on the Hue Citadel by thousands of Vietnamese insurgents. But de Corsi's men fought through the night and beat back their attacks. Once they had control over the city, they proceeded to loot the palace possibly taking as much as 2.6 tons of gold and 30 tons of silver as the royal family fled into their isolated mountain citadels at Tan So, perhaps a sort of take backsies of the previous canceling the debt. There, Tan That Thayet convinced the newest boy king, Ham Nagi, to issue an edict to his nation. This edict called upon the Vietnamese people to Khan Vuong, or aid the king. The emperor was now in open revolt and calling upon the peasants and insurgent movements throughout the country to fight on his behalf against the French. And those mandarins who continued to collaborate could no longer claim to do so on behalf of the emperor. The edict survives today, and we can read certain parts of it to give you an idea of what the emperor was actually telling his people. The emperor proclaims, From time immemorial, there have been only three strategies for opposing the enemy. Attack, defense, and negotiation. Opportunities for attack were lacking. It was difficult to gather required strength for defense. And in negotiations, the enemy demanded everything. In this situation of infinite trouble, we have unwillingly been forced to resort to expedience. Our country recently has faced many critical events. We came to the throne very young. We have been greatly concerned with self-strengthening and sovereign government. Nevertheless, with every passing day, the Western envoys got more and more overbearing. Recently, they brought in troops and naval reinforcements, trying to force on us conditions we could never accept. We received them with normal ceremony, but they refused to accept a single thing. People in the capital became very afraid that trouble was approaching. Our virtue being insufficient amid these events, we did not have the strength to hold out and allowed the capital to fall, forcing the empresses to flee for their lives. The fault is ours entirely, a matter of great shame. But loyalties are strong. Hundreds of mandarins and commanders of all level, perhaps not having the heart to abandon me, unite as never before. Those with intellect helping to plan those with strength willing to fight, those with riches contributing for supplies, all of one mind and body and seeking a way out of danger, a solution to all difficulty. With luck, heaven will also treat man with kindness, turning chaos to order, danger into peace, and helping thus to restore our land and frontiers. Is not this opportunity fortunate for our country, meaning fortunate for the people, since all who worry and work together will certainly reach peace and happiness together. On the other hand, those who fear death more than they love their king, who put concerns of household above concerns of country, mandarins who find excuses to be far away, soldiers who desert, citizens who do not fulfill public duties eagerly for a righteous cause, officers who take the easy way and leave brightness for darkness, all may continue to live in this world, but they will be like animals disguised in clothes and hats. Who can accept such behavior? With rewards generous, Punishments will also be severe. The court retains normal usages so that repentance should not be postponed. All should follow this edict strictly. By imperial order, second day, sixth month, first year of Ham Yi. In the Tonkin region, given the presence of the soldiers, most attacks were directed at military targets. In Anam, however, violence was instead directed against local Catholics. Sources claim that as many as 40,000 Christians may have been killed throughout this rebellion, possibly as much as one-third of their total population beforehand in the country. And in sections of Anam, French and Spanish bishops did organize armed resistance to these attacks. 
A slow French response eventually arrived and relieved the sieges, dispersed the peasants and insurgents, and executed some of the rebellious mandarins. The Queen Mother and other members of the court eventually fled back to Huey, and the French placed Hamnagi's brother upon the throne, Dong Tanha. In Fanhua province, the insurgent leader Din Kong Trung built a fortified camp on the Anam Tonkin border. Like at Sante years before, soldiers here dug in and built a fortified perimeter between three villages and expected to dig in to resist a French attack, hoping to transition to a form of open warfare and confront the French military and defeat it. Their hopes were scattered when the artillery was used to pound their emplacements for a two-month siege. Ultimately, the French suffered 19 dead and 45 wounded. Vietnamese casualties ran into the thousands. Trong had hoped that drawing the French there for a protracted battle would allow other guerrilla movements to stage their own attacks throughout the country. Perhaps a strategy such as this could have worked to undermine them significantly, essentially starting fires that the French could not put out in time. However, the disorganized, scattered, and regional nature of this uprising meant that no coordinated offensive occurred. Instead, the resistance in central Vietnam suffered a dramatic defeat. Uprisings and counter-warfare occurred also in Cochin, China, and Cambodia, but these failed to have a lasting impact. Ham Nghi, the Vietnamese insurgent emperor, was captured and deported to Algeria in 1888. Following this, a second wave of resistance, this time headed by the Mandarin elite in opposition to the French-backed emperor, kicked off. This Van Thin, or Scholar's Resistance, would continue throughout the 1880s and 1890s, most notably headed by Phan Dinh Phuong, who once again came from one of the Mandarin families of Vietnam, had initially in his earlier life been a part of the government of Vietnam. In the Nguyen court, he rose to the rank of imperial censor, a rank which actually allowed him to criticize other Mandarins as well as the emperor himself. He was renowned for his anti-corruption crusades, going to many lengths to actually root out problems inside the government and attempt to create a more fair Vietnam. After Emperor Tuduk's death, the regents who surrounded the throne actually enthroned and then killed three different emperors against Phan's protest, leading to his exile from the government. After leaving, he would organize the Chan Viong Revolutionary Movement, whose aim was to expel France and who wished to place the boy emperor Ham Nghi upon the throne of Vietnam. After initial raids fairly successfully against Catholic villages, French forces did arrive and defeated them, forcing the insurgency back into the countryside rather than meeting them in open battle. As they conducted their guerrilla campaign from the fringes, the French attempted to use intimidation threats. The French threatened to kill his brother. They threatened to imprison his family and to desecrate his town's graves. But Fon refused to bend. Like some of these previous revolutionary movements and heroes, Fon is regarded inside the country as a notable revolutionary who opposed the French. One of the main traits that he's beloved for is his willingness to put patriotism and national pride above his family and his village and himself in all these cases. His forces did conduct a typical guerrilla campaign, far less supplied, far less well funded than their traditional enemies. In 1884, the Chinese were at war again, this time the Sino Japanese War. Formerly, China had continued to supply and support the partisan efforts against the colonial administration and their puppet governments. Among these supplies were, at times, modern repeating Winchester rifles. However, as the war turned against them and the threat loomed that an opportunistic France would declare war on them or in some fashion wring major concessions out of a China unable to fend off its neighbor Japan, closing its border and cutting off supplies to insurgents and bandits dried up the supplies to the Van Thion rebels. They relied primarily upon captured weaponry. In fact, some of the captured French weaponry, they would take Vietnamese artisans, have the weapons disassembled, and produce some facsimile copies. In most cases, they were decent copies, worked well, though they typically lacked rifling as well as other very minute details, meaning their accuracy and deadliness was reduced from their French counterparts. In 1892, Fon's guerrillas attacked the provincial capital, killed Vietnamese soldiers, and liberated their comrades from prison. In response, the French stepped up their efforts. They increasingly built more and more border forts, restricting Fon's movement, essentially giving them military control over an area and the ability to attack his troops if they moved. As their movements were reduced, they had to rely on less and less supplies. But despite this, Fon and his strategic leader, Cao Feng, trained 2,000 soldiers with the plans to stage an attack on another provincial capital, Nagi An. This attack, however, was disastrous. Their initial fierce attacks did overwhelm some of the positions, but the French troops being better armed and defensive fortifications more or less beat back the attack and forced Fon once more into hiding. 
Huang Kaokai, Viceroy of Tonkin, stepped up his efforts with the sole purpose of stopping Fon's movement once and for all. His followers and sympathizers throughout the countryside and the villages were targeted. Fon's family was arrested, and they actually did desecrate his ancestors' graves, displaying the skull of at least some of them publicly. In July 1895, 3,000 additional French troops were requested to end the insurrection. Rebels were increasingly cut off from support of the villages, and they were forced to subsist without supplies and isolated bases. Not just the weaponry, but they were also running out of food. In January 21, 1896, Fawn died from dysentery, and his remaining followers were captured and then executed. In 1893, some border disputes between the King of Siam and the French led to the French entering Siamese National Guard's warships, and after being fired on by the Siamese, the French blockaded their ports and bombarded Bangkok and forced the Siamese to cede portions of its countryside, which it had also done in 1867. Again, in 1888, 1904, and 1907, France would again make Siam, or Thailand, cede more of its territory. In 1938, Siam would be able to gain some of these areas back via a treaty, which did also include the area where the ruins of Angkor Wat are located, interestingly enough. The process of France picking on Thailand time and time again to snatch up little more pieces, essentially modern-day Laos and Cambodia, led to in 1940 and 41, when France was at a low point, having been significantly routed by the Germans in Europe, the Siamese invaded Indochina to mix results, but the friendly Japanese, who were more or less occupying the urban areas at that time, forced the French to return the disputed territories to Siam. By the dawn of the 20th century, for a time at least, it seemed as if physical resistance to French occupation had, if not ended, at least declined to a relatively insignificant level. Behind the scenes, among the new emerging educated classes of the cities, among those who championed reform and change, who looked to nations like Japan as examples, and who began to study Western ideas in hopes of strengthening native culture, new rebellions were forming. Rebellions that in time would give rise to many new ideas, eventually a far more successful rebellion. Thanks for listening. This has been Episode 7 of the History Hour. This has been the end of Prelude to Disaster, Part 1 of our series on the Vietnam War. Stick around and check out where our story goes. Next up is the lead-up to the World Wars, which will set an inevitable course for Vietnamese independence and the clashes that were to come from it. If you're interested in seeing our other material, check out our first series on Mesopotamia. If you like either of these series, leave us a comment or a like, and be sure to share it. We also recently uploaded our bibliography for the Mesopotamia series onto our Patreon. If you'd like some further reading, be sure to check it out. Once this series is finished, or at least close to it, we will also be releasing our bibliography for this one. Coming soon will be our first paid content. We will release our notes and timelines and other data we compiled for the Mesopotamia episode. I'm not saying it's a definitive sampling or anything, but if you're interested in perhaps having some notes to study for an upcoming course, or maybe an outline for your own projects, or even are just interested in having those notes for any number of reasons, think about supporting our channel. We intend to never put our episodes behind a paywall, and your support would go a very long way to helping us achieve self-sufficiency. It's entirely optional, and we aren't asking for much. If you're interested in becoming a big history shill and helping pay for Mr. Kent's premium cigars and Professor White's imported Ferraris, consider stopping by the page and donating a dollar an episode to help us out. Check us out on YouTube, SoundCloud, and Podbean. Watch for updates on Twitter at The History Hour. See you next time. Welcome to the lightning round. This is the part of the episode after the traditional outro where we just throw in a handful more oddball things that don't quite fit anywhere or are kind of humorous. So we mentioned earlier on during the 3rd century, one of the early revolts into Chinese occupation was led, or at least in folklore and legend, by a somewhat mythical figure known as Lady True, who may be based loosely off a real person, but who doesn't show up in the historical record, but is nonetheless a pretty widely revered cultural figure in Vietnam. But the stories of this woman and her exploits are quite interesting, and not to be disrespectful, but definitely border on the outrageous in some cases. In addition to her, you know, being the master of war elephants and the like, there is in one tradition an account, a quote from her, which, when discussing why she was leading rebellion, it reads, 
I'd like to ride storms, kill sharks in the open ocean, drive out the aggressors, reconquer the country, undo the ties of serfdom, and never bend my back to be a concubine. An interesting speech. Again, not to be disrespectful, but that's something other than a cartoon character than a real person. Hey man, after a long day of fighting Chinese, who doesn't want to go kill some sharks? In a, in a somewhat similar vein, in 1407, when the Ming decided to attempt to reoccupy Vietnam after a period of independence, we mentioned that they had essentially ostensibly invaded to restore the Po's dynasty and took the rebel leader, Po Kwe Lai, and his sons into captivity in iron cages, and presumably had them executed at some point, though official records don't say when. One of this man's sons, Po Nguyen Trung, not only survives, is later set free and decides to live in China. He moves to Beijing, later goes into business and makes quite a tidy profit selling weapons, and decides in 1438 to write one of the first written histories of Vietnam, which was apparently widely published and read in China among some circles, which was a rather unexpected end to a heir to a rebel defeated in battle. My companion mentioned the Opium War earlier, talking about how that French troops were readily available for a campaign because they were in the region fighting China. The Opium War is one of those fascinating little events where a number of nations, Britain, France, and others, were fighting China. It was arguably the first war on drugs, except in this case it was being fought for the right of merchants to sell drugs. The British argued that we might make opium illegal in this country, but damn it, our merchants have the right to sell it. The Chinese disagreed but unfortunately it was like military force out of the issue and suddenly opium for everybody. It is a funny thing, if you grew up in my generation you might have seen those fear mongering commercials like if you buy marijuana you're supporting terrorism. Well, back in the day it was at these fringe elements profit off, but no, it was full on western powers just forcing the drug trade on China and other nations wanting to ban it.